Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, just a few weeks ago, this chamber congratulated Henry Wuga on reaching his 100th birthday. So it was with great sadness that we learned of his passing peacefully at home with his daughters Hilary and Gillian last Friday. We send them our thoughts and condolences, and we also give thanks to the life of this remarkable man, from Nuremberg in 1939 to Glasgow via the Kinder Transport, to life of professional and family success here in Scotland, capped by decades of service to Holocaust education. Scotland will miss his charm, his integrity and resolution, but we will never forget his testimony. And I believe that we can all commit to ensuring that his legacy will endure. Now reunited with his beloved Ingrid, may his memory be a blessing. Presiding officer, can I remind the chamber that my wife is a serving officer with Police Scotland. The Hate Crime Act comes into effect on the 1st of April. We voted against this law and still oppose it as a serious risk to free speech. But in just 11 days' time, the police will have to enforce it. David Kennedy, the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, has said this about training. We're only receiving a two-hour online training package. First Minister, is that really enough for a complex and controversial piece of legislation? First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, first and foremost, can I join with Douglas Ross in paying tribute to Henry Wuga, uh, a greatly respected Holocaust survivor who we know passed away at the age of 100 uh, earlier this week. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to think that only a few weeks ago we stood up uh, to wish him well uh, on his 100th birthday and now we're standing up once again uh, to, to mourn uh, his uh, passing because Henry was a truly remarkable man who made an enormous contribution to Scottish society but his impact, his influence, his legacy goes far beyond uh, Scotland as he campaigned against anti-Semitism and of course reminded us to never ever forget the horrors of the Holocaust. My thoughts are very much with Henry's uh, family, his friends and all those who had the privilege of knowing him and in, in his memory, we will all continue, I'm sure, uh, to campaign against hatred in whichever form it rears its ugly head. Presenting officer, can I also just take, with your indulgence, a moment to congratulate Von Gething on his appointment as First Minister of Wales, his appointment as the first black leader of a government in the UK uh, is a truly monumental moment and I look forward to working uh, with him. Vaughan Gething's predecessor, Mark, Rayford, Mark Drakeford, was a principled first minister, a model public servant, importantly, a very fierce defender of devolution. I think the whole chamber want to join me in wishing him well. Yeah. <laughs> Presenting officer, to the matter uh, at hand, um, first of all, uh, let me say, as when it comes to the hate crime uh, bill, uh, the Hate Crime Act, forgive me, there has been a lot of disinformation uh, that has been spread on social media and some inaccurate media reporting uh, and indeed by our political opponents. So I'm hoping this exchange we can shed uh, more light than heat on what is actually in the Act uh, as opposed to what is being said about it. In terms of training for police, let me say that I leave it as an operational decision and a matter for the Chief Constable to determine uh, what uh, training is absolutely appropriate and of course Police Scotland put out a statement just this week to, uh, to challenge some of, in their words, the inaccurate media reporting that exists uh, around the Hate Crime uh, Act. So I've got absolute confidence in Police Scotland to ensure the appropriate training is in place. And let me just remind Douglas Ross, of course, that stirring up offences are not new in Scotland. You know, as a person of colour, I've been protected from anybody stirring up hatred uh, against me because of my race virtually all of my life, since 1986. In fact, all of us are protected uh, by that uh, provision of stirring up hatred. The question is, if I have protection against somebody stirring up hatred because of my race, and that has, uh, has been the case since 1986, why on earth should those protections not exist for somebody because of their sexuality mm -hmm. or disability 
or, 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 or their uh, religion. So the facts are that for an offence, a new stunning up offence uh, to be committed, uh, we know there is a very high threshold, in fact, an even higher threshold than the barrier uh, that there is or the threshold that there is for a racial stirring up offence. And I would say to Douglas Ross, it's incredibly important in the memory of people like Henry Ruger, uh, where he started his contribution, that we all unite in standing up and opposing hatred in all of yeah. its forms. Yeah, yeah. And a strong legislative framework mm -hmm. uh, to protect people is incredibly important. I would urge the Conservatives, I would urge Douglas Ross, that it, it, it would be far better for him, I think, to put more effort into tackling hatred as opposed to opposing a hate crime yeah, act. Yeah. Dr. Shaw. Can I echo the First Minister's comments uh, and wish Vaughan Gethins well uh, as the new First Minister of Wales? But we opposed the legislation at the time and still oppose it now because of the impact it has on free speech for people uh, across this country. Uh, and I'm only uh, reiterating the points made by the Scottish Police Federation, the representative body of our officers across Scotland. They say that their officers can barely deal with existing crimes, let alone this new law. They described the Hate Crime Act as, and I quote, a recipe for disaster. Hamza Youssef has reduced officer numbers to the lowest level since Police Scotland was formed. Now officers are being told not to investigate actual crimes, but instead they'll have to look for the hate monster or police free speech. Criminals will be let off while innocent people are prosecuted. Isn't Hamza Youssef setting the police up for failure and undermining public trust in policing? First Minister. Presenting officer, with that contribution, it is Douglas Ross who is undermining the fight against hatred yeah. here in Scotland. Absolutely undermining it completely, utterly and entirely through so much disinformation. I don't even know where to begin. So let's take point by point of what Douglas Ross has said. First and foremost, he makes an incorrect uh, claim around police officer numbers under the SNP uh, government. Of course, under the SNP government, numbers of police officers uh, have increased and will continue to increase, given, given what we have heard recently from the Chief Constable and backed by a record budget from this uh, Scottish Government. And of course, there are more police officers per head in Scotland than in England, where his party is, of course, in charge. Let's take the points that Douglas, raises, uh, Douglas Ross raises around the Act itself and freedom of expression. Uh, I remember, of course, because I was the Justice Secretary that took forward this bill, uh, making sure that I engaged with opposition members around the issue of freedom of expression. There is a triple lock of freedom of expression yeah. uh, in the Act. There is protection of freedom of expression that's actually explicitly embedded in the Act. There's also a defence available of a person's behaviour being reasonable, which safeguards people's rights. And thirdly, of course, the Act itself is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, including Article 10, which includes and protects everybody's yep. right uh, to freedom. When it comes to stirring up uh, of hatred, presiding officer, they, stirring up offences are so pervasive, so damaging, so dangerous in our society. Let me just take Douglas Ross back to what Lord Brackadale said. Lord Brackadale, of course, was the one who reported on his independent review of hate crime, which then led to the development of legislation. He said, and I'll quote, the stirring up of hatred can contribute to a social atmosphere in which prejudice and discrimination are accepted as normal. Yeah. In any society, presiding officer, the freedom to criticise, the freedom to insult, the freedom to offend is, exists and should be treasured, in fact. But there cannot be freedom to engage in behaviour that is threatening or abusive yeah and intended to start up hatred. Yep. So everybody in this chamber, we engage, we talk often about our commitment to tackle uh, hatred. Those who experience hatred tell me they don't just want warm words from their politicians, they want action, and that's exactly what this yep. Hate Crime yep. Act wait, wait. intends to do. Dr. <laughs> Shaws. But people want action that is enforceable, and the Scottish Police Federation are saying they have serious concerns. Their officers are receiving a two-hour online training module for this legislation. And the First Minister keeps trying to say these are my comments. They're not. I originally was quoting the Scottish Police Federation. Let me now quote legal experts like Roddy Dunlop, the Dean of the... Oh. 
Please continue, Mr yeah, Ross. I think it's only right that we say ministers in the Scottish Government don't think we should be hearing from the Faculty of Advocates. Please well, continue, Mr Ross. Let I, us hear Mr Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say it was Marie Todd. It was uh, the Minister that Mr. said that. Mr Ross can ask you to continue with your question. Members, can we please ensure that we can hear Mr Ross? So, legal experts, including Roddy Dunlop, the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates said there is a danger of the police being swamped by completely malicious complaints. Not my views, but the Dean of the Faculty of Advocates. Days before this law comes into force, it's unclear how those complaints would be dealt with by the police. People like J.K. Rowling could have the police at her door every day for making perfectly reasonable statements. That could lead to huge numbers of the public being monitored or even criminalised by the police when they have done nothing wrong. Isn't Hamza Youssef putting frontline officers in an impossible position by forcing them to police free speech? First Minister. No, uh, presiding officer, we know it's often police officers, unfortunately, that are the victims of hatred themselves. Yeah. They are often the ones who are facing hatred when it comes to uh, the course of their duties. Uh, presiding officer, Douglas Ross says he has no idea how a stunning up offence could possibly be enforceable. I'm making the point that stirring up a fence in relation to racial hatred yeah. has existed since 1986 yeah. Yeah. with virtually zero controversy yeah. whatsoever. So I have absolute faith so in Police point? Scotland's ability to uh, police and enforce uh, this act mm -hmm. in a way that is appropriate. In terms of the points that Roddy Dunlop put, of course I respect uh, greatly. The points that I would say uh, in, 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 in respect to Roddy uh, Dunlop is that police, again, are very, very well attuned, adept, and have ability to deal with vexatious complaints right across the legal framework with which they operate. So I can't tell you whether there'll be vexatious complaints or not. That will, of course, uh, depend on, on, on people's uh, actions. But what I can say is that the liability for criminal threshold is incredibly high. If you don't want to take my word for it, Let's look at another legal expert. This one, Professor Adam Tompkins, I think known uh, to uh, Douglas Ross, formerly a Conservative MSP, somebody I worked with in relation to the hate crime bill. He writes uh, in today's uh, Herald. Uh, he's, of course, a professor of public law, and I'll quote from him directly. Offensive speech is not criminalised by this legislation. Yeah. The only speech relating to sexual orientation, transgender identity, age or disability outlawed here is speech which one, a reasonable person, would con two, consider to be threatening or abusive, three, which was intended to stir up hatred, yeah. and four, was not reasonable in any circumstances. Yeah. He goes on to say, just because you feel offended by what someone does, does not make it a hate crime. And then yeah. goes on to say, under the Hate Crime Act, the threshold of criminal liability is not a victim that feels offended, i.e. a subjective test, but that a reasonable person would consider the perpetrator's actions or speech to be threatening or abusive. So, presiding officer, let's stick to the facts. And the facts are this, that we are all purport to be concerned about the rises in hate crime that we've seen in our society over the years. But there's only some parties in this chamber that I believe are willing to take the action that is necessary to tackle it. It was, of course, a, an act and a bill at that point that was debated thoroughly in this chamber. It is, it is unfortunate that the only party that opposed it, of course, was the Conservatives yeah. presiding office. Dr Shaws. In a democracy, we have scrutiny. We have opposition parties to look at the legislation coming forward. And there have been and continue to be serious reservations about this act that was passed and now how it will be implemented. Let's remember Hamza Youssef introduced this unworkable and dangerous law when he was Justice Secretary. Now he's bringing it into force as First Minister with little training and not enough support for the officers who will have to enforce it. Let's have a quote from a professor of law at Glasgow University, First Minister it just quoted. Alistair Bonington said this, like many of the SNP's attempts at lawmaking, this act will be set aside when it is properly examined in a serious court. This looks like another SNP law that will have to be discarded, just like the name persons and the offensive behaviour at Football Act. We've said from the outset this law is a disaster in the making. It criminalises free speech. 
It risks a fundamental right. It's overreached by the SNP into people's homes. It could result in the public being criminalised for no good reason. It is set to be a Let's shambles. Hear Mr. Ross. It is set to be a shambles from day one in just 11 days' time. So will Hamza Yusuf finally accept that he has created another bad SNP law that will quickly descend into chaos? First Minister. What's a dangerous, presiding officer, isn't the law. What's dangerous is hate crime in our society, presiding officer. You see, presiding officer, we did uh, debate uh, this uh, act when it was, of course, a bill going through this parliament extensively. Uh, many uh, years ago, robust debate. Actually, I thought debate, and sometimes and often, the best traditions of this parliament. There was compromises. There was amendments that were accepted uh, by the government. We came out of that process with a good piece of legislation that fundamentally protected people's yeah. freedom of expression, freedom of speech, yeah. but also safeguarded people's right not to have hatred stirred up against them. And of course, there was only one party that opposed that bill. Douglas Ross and the Conservative yeah. Party. And maybe, yeah. presiding officer, it's hardly a surprise, yeah. given that the Conservative Party, far from working hard to tackle hatred, they're a party that have actively created the conditions yeah. for hatred yeah. and division Absolutely. to thrive in our society. Absolutely. The Conservative Party, presiding officer, Thank are you. the party. Let's hear the First Minister. The Conservative Party are the party of go home vans, yeah. the party of the hostile environment. Yeah the party of Windrush, the party whose leader Boris Johnson called Muslim Briefly, women First Minister. bank robbers party. They are a party that indulges in Islamophobic smears from Suella Braverman yep. to Lee Anderson. Yeah. So instead of fighting against this bill, Briefly, wouldn't First be better Minister. presiding officer that the Conservatives got their own house in order? Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Can I join others in, first of all, paying tribute to Henry Wuga, a Holocaust survivor who very powerfully uh, shared his own story, the stories of others, and always campaigned against anti-Semitism. And we send our best wishes to his friends, family, and the wider Jewish community. Uh, we owe it to Henry and his entire generation to make sure we share their stories and always strive for both peace and strive for a world free of prejudice and hate. Can I also join uh, the First Minister in uh, congratulating Ron Gething on his election, uh, another historic first, uh, the first ever black leader of a nation uh, in Europe uh, as the First Minister of Wales, and send our best wishes to his predecessor, uh, Mark Drakeford. <laughs> Presiding officer, this morning a damning report by the Royal College of Paediatric and Child Health has warned of the catastrophic consequences of this government's failure. In paediatrics alone, over 10,000 children are waiting for the medical care they need. 50% of them have been waiting for more than the legal 12 weeks. So how does the First Minister respond to one of the leading paediatric consultants in the country, Dr. Mary Stark, who said, if you miss the right window to treat a child or wait too long, the consequences can be irreversible, and that this is a clear failure to prioritise the health and well-being of our children? First Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, I would take the uh, report from the Royal College extremely uh, seriously uh, indeed. And of course, we'll be examining uh, and are examining that report uh, in detail. Uh, as ever, of course, it is important for me to provide uh, some context of why we're seeing such high numbers uh, of young people, young children uh, waiting. The undeniable reason for that significant increase is undoubtedly the global pandemic, hence why we've seen those uh, significant increases in paediatric waits right across the UK and England uh, and in Wales and of course here in Scotland too. Uh, Anna Sawar uh, is right of course and Royal College are right uh, to raise the concerns around uh, this issue. So let me try to give some assurances that we are focusing on tackling uh, these far too long waits in paediatrics uh, just as some uh, by way of some examples. Uh, we know that there's two main paediatric specialities, paediatrics and paediatric surgery. If I take the data from April uh, 23 to the end of the calendar year, uh, December 23, the paediatric new outpatient list reduced by 21%, uh, weights over 52 weeks reduced by 12%, and we wait, uh, weights over 78 weeks reduced by 31%, and uh, weights over uh, two years were completely uh, eradicated. <clears throat> if I take the position over the, the two years, December 21 to December 2023, and look at paediatric surgery, 
The new outpatient list for paediatric surgery reduced by 35 per cent, uh, weights of over 52 per cent reduced by 84 per cent, uh, over 78 weeks reduced by 95 per cent. The purpose of uh, uh, reiterating these statistics, and uh, we know that, of course, behind each of these statistics is a young child who's waiting and waiting uh, too long for surgery, is to show that there are improvements, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, what, of course, makes the recovery of the NHS uh, far more difficult is the fact that, of course, we are uh, cut, uh, we're receiving cuts from our, the Conservatives on our budget, £500 million over two years, £1.3 billion in terms uh, of uh, our capital. Uh, we are, of course, investing in our NHS despite those cuts. It would be helpful to know from Anna Sawa that if there is an incoming uh, Labour government, that they would immediately reverse those Conservative cuts because it impedes our ability in order to invest in the NHS's recovery, which, of course, is much needed for our children, our young people, as well as our adults, too. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister knows that this problem predates the pandemic, that the report makes clear 11 years of decline, every day of which there has been an SNP government. And he also knows that Labour is going to invest more in the National Health Service and we do want to bring down waiting lists. But he has to take responsibility for his government's actions, not look to blame somebody else all the time. <laughs> the crisis in children's health goes further than even this report warns. Across our NHS, whether in CAM services or in other specialisms, children face unacceptable waits that have left them distressed and in pain. Uh, one mum, Amy, has told me the struggles faced by her three-year-old son, Cody. Uh, Cody has been repeatedly diagnosed with tonsillitis and his enlarged tonsils obstruct over 75% of his airway, making it difficult to eat, drink and even breathe. She's told me that she has to lie awake next to him during the night because his breathing stops and she has to nudge him to restart his breathing again. She's had to fight to get Cody referred to a specialist, but has been told that an urgent referral for treatment will take three years. Amy has had to make the difficult decision to go private, borrowing almost £5,000 from her family. Why is he and his government failing Amy, Cody and so many families like theirs. First Minister. I'm obviously more than happy uh, to look at the case that uh, is referenced uh, by Anna Sawar in terms of uh, Cody's case and indeed any other case that a member raises. We're happy to explore with the Health Board in terms of what more uh, can be done. It sounds like a, a horrifically long wait uh, that we don't want any parent to have to endure. Uh, the point I make to Anna Sawar is, of course, that there is progress being made. I've given him a range of uh, details around how that uh, progress is being made in relation to paediatric uh, surgery, which is relevant uh, to his question. But we're also making sure that we're investing in the workforce. So paediatric special, specialty consultants, uh, we've increased uh, their numbers by 15% in the last five years, by 64% in the last 10 years. When we look at qualified paediatric nurses, the workforce has increased mm -hmm. by 11% in the last five years and, and since 2014 we've also invested in, in the recruitment of an additional 500 health visitors and 200 extra school nurses again which undoubtedly help with young people and children's uh, health uh, and well-being uh, and um, so I, I don't take lightly at all the issues that Anna Sawa raises about the long waits that uh, parents and the children are having uh, to suffer and, and Anna Sawa's initial response of course he didn't uh, answer the question that I asked which was that, of course, would uh, an incoming Labour government, potentially incoming Labour government, immediately reverse yep. the £1.3 billion cut, yep. which is making an impact in terms of our health care provision. Uh, if he could Briefly, give that First Minister, that we may be able to plan further ahead in terms of the further investment we're able to make, because it's only through record investment in the NHS are we going to be able to recover our national health services for children and, and young people. Uh, honestly, Presiding Officer, after 17 years of this SNP government wanting to ask questions about a party in opposition rather than talking about their own record and failing children across the country just shows how out of depth this Funnest Minister is. All those lists, all those excuses mean nothing to Amy, mean nothing to Cody, and mean nothing to the thousands of families that his government is failing every single day. Because he simply does not get it. In every area of responsibility for this SNP government, children are being failed with catastrophic consequences. After 17 years of this SNP government, 240,000 children are living in poverty, over 10,000 children waiting for paediatric medical care, over 9,500 children 
turned away from mental health services last year. I suggest the Deputy First Minister listen to the consequences for her constituents rather than trying to heckle what's happening to children across this country. And for those that were referred, over 5,500 children are waiting to get mental health support. And now nearly a third of pupils in Scotland are persistently absent from school in some areas as high as 50%. Almost 40% of pupils now need additional support. At the same time, this SNP government has cut 400 ASN posts in the last decade. Isn't it clear that Hamza Youssef and every single member of this SNP government are failing Scotland's children? First Minister. No, I, 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 I don't uh, agree with that. I thought it was a pretty reasonable question, which obviously Anna Sarwar is unable to answer, and he'll want to maybe be honest with people about the answer. He was unable to answer a very simple question that if there is an incoming Labour government, will they immediately reverse the Tory cut to Scotland's budget? The fact that he was unable to answer the question demonstrates that he either does not know the answer, presiding officer, or he is not being honest with the people of Scotland. And what I would say to Anna Sawa is it is fundamentally important in all of the areas of public service that we invest. That's why this government took the decision to make sure we prioritise our public services. That's why we yep. gave an increase to the National Health Service, made sure there was an increase to education services, made there there was an increase to social security. Yep. All of these issues incredibly important for our children and young people. That is why, of course, the estimates show that 100,000 children in Scotland will be lifted out of poverty because of our actions. That's why, of course, more young people in this country are going to university from areas of higher deprivation because of our investment. That's why more young people, we have record uh, young people going into positive destinations because of our investment in education, yeah. early learning and childcare presiding uh, officer. Briefly, First Minister. And that is why, of course, it is imperative throughout all of these challenges that governments and political parties make a decision. Do they invest in public services? Thank you, First Minister. We must move services? on to the next question. First Minister. Is it First Minister. First Minister. I have asked that you conclude your question. I am now moving on to the next question. That you conclude, that you conclude your response. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I associate the, the Scottish Liberal Democrats with the remarks already met, made about the passing of Henry Wooger and indeed the election of Ron Gething? Um, to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Tuesday. Alex Cole Hamilton. Presiding officer, yesterday the Committee on Climate Change delivered a devastating verdict about the record of the Scottish Government. The key 2030 emissions target just won't be met. The Government is off course by a country mile on heat pumps, electric vehicles, recycling and more. And its chair, Chris Stark, said yesterday the strategy is just not there. Take tree planting. They say Scotland needs to do twice as much, but the Government has just reduced spending on that by nearly half. It's going to put people out of work and tree nurseries have already signalled they will have to torch hundreds of thousands of saplings because of the cuts. To think the Environment Secretary once boasted that global leaders were looking to her government for advice. Well, her phone is silent now. So can I ask the First Minister, where are the Green Party in all of this? Fewer bus and train services going nowhere on renewable heating, a botched deposit return scheme. Doesn't he recognise that bringing them into government has done precious little to help us combat the climate emergency. First Minister. Uh, thank you, sir. First of all, we do take the report from the Climate Change Committee extremely uh, seriously and uh, Chris Stark uh, well respected and therefore, of course, his opinions are being given uh, the due and weighty consideration that uh, they uh, deserve. It's a serious point, of course, that he raises around the 2030 target. Of course, at the time when that target was being debated, the Climate Change Committee made it uh, clear that it would be extremely difficult, uh, if not frankly impossible, uh, or, or indeed that, 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 that target uh, was stretching credibility at that time. Nonetheless, we as a parliament came together, all political parties yeah. came together uh, to embed that target within the legislation. In terms of tree planting, let me just remind Alex Cole Hamilton that around 75% of all new woodland throughout the UK yeah. is here in Scotland. Not only that, we, la yeah. we launched, of course, the world's largest floating offshore wind leasing round through Scotland. We ensured, of course, 
that Scotland has the most concessionary travel scheme uh, in the UK, with more than a third of the population benefiting from free bus travel. We invested £65 million in installation of over uh, 2,700 public EV charges, and we continue to offer the most generous package of grants and loans in the UK to support the move to clean uh, heating. What I would say to Artscoe Hamilton, what makes this uh, job of ours more difficult in trying to reach our targets, and we are committed to that overall 2045 target, of course, what makes that more difficult is every time we bring forward measures, be it the deposit return scheme, low emission zones, workplace parking levy, proposals Briefly, for First capture, Minister. or indeed our standards around heating and reducing emissions. What makes that job far more difficult, presiding officer, is that the opposition oppose every single measure yeah. we bring to this chamber so to tackle the climate crisis. Question number four, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what analysis of passenger behaviour and numbers has been carried out since the inception of the removal of peak railfares pilot. First Minister. The trial is uh, an exciting and unique opportunity to encourage more people to leave their cars at home, choose a safe, reliable and green form of public transport. Uh, I can confirm that an interim analysis is due to be published shortly. It examines the impact on rail travel patterns and other modes. The Scottish Government will carefully consider the impact and, of course, the long-term sustainability of any further measures before we confirm what our next steps are. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, the removal of peak fares has been greatly welcomed by my Aberdeen central constituents and by tens of thousands of other people across Scotland. Uh, and in my opinion, it uh, has been uh, beneficial to many during these tough times caused by the cost of living crisis. Uh, can the First Minister give an indication on whether the removal of peak fares will become permanent? First Minister. Well, I'm really pleased to hear about the positive impact that it's, uh, this uh, particular policy is having on Mr Stewart's constituents. And I've heard similar stories from my own constituents and constituents of other MSPs right across the country, particularly during this cost of living uh, crisis. But the purpose of the Scott Rail uh, peak fares uh, is, is, is twofold, uh, to find out uh, whether such measures uh, do help to move people from car to rail use, uh, but also to help passengers facing the cost of living crisis. So we know that price and simplicity are crucial for people when it comes to choosing how to travel. So the pilot, we know, as has already been said, operate until the end of June. Uh, as, as such, it would be, of course, inappropriate to confirm whether, of course, uh, the abolition of peak fares will become uh, permanent ahead of a final evaluation. Um, so it will be important to, to review the data as the entire purpose, of course, uh, of the pilot to see whether or not we're seeing that modal shift and uh, to examine the data around how much uh, this is helping people during a cost of living crisis. But of course, when that evaluation uh, has been appropriately analysed, uh, we will, of course, inform Parliament uh, of the next stages and steps in relation to this particular policy. Alec Crowley. Sign officer, there's no doubt that if we are to get any place near reaching our net zero targets, then we have to do much better when it comes to reducing emissions and transport. So will the First Minister commit to come back to this chamber in enough time so that we will be able to hopefully make this, 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 this pilot permanent? Because what in effect is the case is that, that people are being priced off public transport. And if we want to tackle that and we want to get more people to use public transport, then it is exactly this type of step, which I welcome, that we need to now make permanent. First Minister. I can say to uh, Alex uh, Rowley that, uh, of course, we will evaluate the data and we will, uh, of course, bring forward analysis uh, of that data. It's important that we don't preempt that data. We need to see whether the data actually has uh, it has uh, shown us, has demonstrated that modal shift that Alex Riley rightly uh, talks about. So let's not preempt that data. Uh, let's examine that data. Let's analyse the evidence, and then let's let other MSPs uh, do the same with the analysis of that data. I agree with the thrust of his question, though, that it is important to invest in our public transport. Hence, why I'm very pleased that this government invested in leaving Mouth Railway, something that, of course, Alex Riley, I'm sure. Uh, would welcome. It's why we have an extremely generous concessionary uh, travel scheme. I would say, uh, though gently to, to Alex Rowley, that is why I make the point that it is extremely frustrating for this government when we do bring forward uh, uh, various policies to encourage that modal shift to help to reduce our carbon emissions. They are often opposed by the opposition. We brought forward the workplace parking levy, for example. Yeah. It was called by his colleague, who is sitting just a couple of rows behind him, Colin Smith. He described it as highway robbery. 
He called it a car, car park tax. So it's really unfortunate, presiding officer, that when we bring forward these measures, opposition parties oppose it simply for the sake of opposing it. Yeah. Question number five, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, presiding officer, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will engage with NHS Scotland on ending the prescription of puberty suppressing hormones to children following the recent announcement by NHS England. First Minister. Presiding officer, we are uh, aware of the new clinical policy issued by NHS England last week on the routine prescription of puberty suppressing hormones for children and young people as a treatment option for gender dysphoria. The details of this are being closely considered by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, and its relevant clinical team, obviously, as the provider of young people's gender services at Sandyford. Any decision on how such health care is delivered in Scotland will rightly be made by health boards, but most importantly, uh, the clinicians involved. It should be noted NHS England's announcement follows our interim policy position last year, recommending puberty blockers are only accessed via a research programme it is establishing. The Scottish Government and NHS Scotland remain observers to this particular study and we're considering what further engagement may be appropriate. Megan Gallagher. I asked the First Minister about the prescription of puberty blockers to children in May last year. The First Minister said, and I quote, I support such decisions being made by clinicians by the people who have clinical knowledge. We should trust those who have clinical expertise, as opposed to standing here in the chamber making judgments about what is best for young people who need gender identity services. But the truth of the matter is, we don't know if puberty blockers have long-term, life-changing consequences on young people who take them. That's why NHS England are conducting a review. Therefore, will the First Minister publish all evidence his government has that puberty blockers are safe for children? And if his government doesn't have any evidence, why is he allowing NHS health boards to prescribe them? First Minister. Sorry, officer, uh, Megan Gallagher read out my response to her last time round. My position hasn't changed one iota, it hasn't changed one bit. I still believe it is the point that clinical experts in Scotland should be the ones who determine whether or not puberty blockers are prescribed or not. I think that's a sensible position as opposed to politicians demanding uh, what clinical treatment should be. It should be for the clinical experts. In terms of the study that is taking place, I did reference in my response to Megan Gallagher's very first question that we are engaging with the study that's taking place. Uh, the Scottish Government and NHS Scotland are well engaged with NHS England on its planned study into the use of puberty blockers in young people's gender identity healthcare. We are uh, observers to that study and that remains a work in progress. Uh, we are considering what future engagement in that research may well be possible. So I just go back to the point that I've made already uh, to uh, Megan uh, Gallagher. Uh, of course, uh, it is for clinicians uh, to make these judgments. I think it is right that we trust our clinical uh, clinicians and their expert uh, uh, decision uh, making. And in terms of the studies that are taking place in England, I'm more than happy to confirm that we are uh, observers. Uh, we are uh, keeping close to NHS England and we'll continue to do so as that study develops. Question number six, Polly McNeill. To ask the First Minister what resources the Scottish Government will be providing to Police Scotland for the investigation of complaints made under the Hate Crime and Public Order Act 2021. First Minister. Mm -hmm. officer, we have worked with justice partners, including of course Police Scotland, to ensure the Act is effectively implemented when it commences next month. The Scottish Police Authority's budget for 24-25 delivers record police funding of £1.55 billion. It's an increase of 92 0.7 million when compared to the current financial year. It is for the SPA and the Chief Constable to allocate this uh, budget according to their priorities and their needs, and that should absolutely include the investigation of uh, complaints that are made under the Hate Crime Act. I'm aware that some commentary in the Act, as I've already said, is not really reflective or indeed accurate of the measures in the Act, which was passed by a majority of this Parliament. Uh, the Act does not stop freedom of expression, however, it does make unlawful the intention of stirring up hatred against a person or community for particular characteristics, as the law already does for race. Holly McNeill. The First Minister has reiterated several times today that the Hate Crime Act, which comes into force on the 1st of April, must deliver what Parliament intended, that people must not be criminalised for expressing their opinions, and I agree. Some organisations are still concerned this legislation will be used maliciously to silence legitimate opinion. And it would be helpful, First Minister, if the Scottish Government would engage with those groups. 
So does the First Minister agree that how the Act is interpreted by the police is key and how they are trained is key and their resources are crucially important? So does the First Minister understand my concerns that the police are not properly resourced but crucially properly and adequately trained to implement the Act as it was intended? Yeah. And we agree on this, that it could risk criminalising innocent people and further stretching police resources. Make this Act work and make sure that there is full resources to ensure that what this Parliament intended is delivered. First Minister. Uh, President, officer, can I say uh, that I know Polly McNeill takes the issue of tackling hatred very, very seriously. It's something she and I have worked on uh, over the years uh, in many uh, different uh, guises. Let me try to give some assurance to Polly McNeill and those, uh, for, for, uh, those uh, she is raising uh, concerns on behalf of. Uh, first of all, I make the point that I made already to Douglas Ross that there are multiple freedom of expression safeguards within the law. Uh, there, are, uh, there is explicitly a freedom of expression safeguard within the legislation. There is, of course, the reasonable person uh, defence. But there is also, of course, the fact that the legislation has to apply with the European Convention of Human Rights and Article 10 being particularly important. So there's a triple lock of safeguards that are already there. In terms of how the police then, uh, then enforce uh, the act, let me again try to give Pauline O'Neill some assurances. Uh, police officers since 1986, um, virtually my, my, my whole life, uh, have been, uh, I think, effectively policing and enforcing the law and stirring up of hatred for uh, crimes in relation to race. Uh, now, the threshold uh, for the uh, new offences is higher than, of course, the racial stirring up offence. But if they've been doing so since 1986, with virtually zero controversy. I've got every confidence that they're able to do so for the new offences that are being brought into law in just a matter of weeks uh, time. In terms of uh, resourcing and training, I'll just reiterate the points I've already made. Uh, we are providing record uh, funding uh, for, Police, uh, Scotland in, uh, for, for Police Scotland in relation uh, to the next year's budget. And in training, uh, again, refer to the points that have already been made by Police Scotland in the public domain. Uh, and I have every confidence uh, in their ability to train officers for this act uh, when it comes into force. And I'm very pleased this act will be coming into force because I believe it will give people the necessary protections at a time when we're seeing hate crime uh, far too pervasive in our society, uh, far too prominent in our society, and being peddled uh, by some within Thank you, our First Minister. Ivan McKee. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that the Police Scotland hate crime website explicitly stereotypes young working class men from constituencies like mine and his as most likely to commit a hate crime. Does he agree with me that publicly demonising this disadvantaged group already heavily impacted by negative interactions with the criminal justice system and disproportionately damaged by addiction and other challenges will neither assist them nor aid efforts by many community groups and others Let's in my hear Mr. McKee. who work to create opportunities for them? First Minister. I'm not sure, uh, Planning Officer, why the Conservatives were shouting down uh, Mr McKee when he was answer, asking his question. I think it's a legitimate point that when it comes to any marketing, any awareness campaigns that are done, it's exceptionally important that there's no stigmatisation of uh, any communities whatsoever. Let's just stick to the evidence and the facts in relation to those who are victims and indeed uh, anybody uh, that is a perpetrator of uh, hate crime. But let's do that in a way that doesn't stigmatise one or other community and certainly doesn't pit communities against each other. The entire point of the hate crime uh, act and indeed I think all of our endeavours or most of our endeavours in this chamber around tackling hate crime are around so that we can have a more cohesive society as opposed to one that, that, that pits one community uh, against another. So I do agree with Ivan McKee that we should focus on, uh, on, on tackling stigmatisation, uh, stig uh, stigma, wherever it exists uh, in our uh, society. He's also right to highlight that many org organisations uh, and agencies that are providing opportunities to Thank our young you, people, First Minister. whether it's the work of Skills Development Scotland, national training programmes and apprenticeship programmes, and many others that are supporting our young people during these Thank challenging you, times. Thank you, First Minister. In the time we have available for constituency and general supplementaries, I call Liam Kerr. Very grateful, Presiding Officer. Devastating figures this week revealed people can be waiting up to two years for audiology assessments at NHS Grampian. The Chief Executive, Adam Caldwell, has laid the blame for that squarely at the door of this government, which underfunds the service and fails to properly workforce plan. How precisely does this government intend to drive these waiting times down, and when will the people of the North East see results? First Minister. Uh, first and foremost, when it comes to long waits, I reiterate what I've already uh, said here, that anybody is waiting far too long, uh, of course, that is not acceptable. Uh, and we are working hard uh, to recover our NHS uh, services. In terms of 
Uh, Grampian itself in 24-25 NHS uh, frontline boards will receive, of course, increased investment of almost uh, 550 million, a real terms increase of almost uh, 3%. NHS Grampian seeing 46 £0.6 million pounds, uh, increase in its investment. And that is the decisions that this government is proud uh, to take, in very stark contrast to the Conservatives in England. We are investing in our NHS at a time when they're choosing tax cuts for the wealthy over investment in public services, presiding officer. And Bob Doris. <laughs> presiding officer, babies across the UK face delay in treatment for the debilitating genetic condition spiral muscular atrophy because no newborn screening programme exists. I recently met two impacted families who want to know why the majority of European countries screen for SMA, yet we don't. Something I've been campaigning for for some time. It makes a real difference to the lives of newborn babies. Does the First Minister agree with me, given it now appears likely there will be a UK screening pilot for SMA, that Scotland should be included? And will the First Minister meet with me to discuss work undertaken in Scotland to prepare for such a pilot, including, I think he will welcome, identifying potential partnership funds to deliver it? First Minister. I do, uh, of course, recognise the urgency uh, families in Scotland feel around this issue for those affected by spinal musco, uh, muscular uh, atrophy. Uh, it can be absolutely devastating. I share the desire for any action that would prevent that. Uh, the UK National Screening Committee is very much in the best place to evaluate all the evidence and I do welcome the in-service evaluation that NHS England is carrying out. I hope that that will bring uh, us closer to a decision. Discussions are ongoing about the potential for a Scottish-specific study uh, or for Scotland to participate in uh, the ISE and the, the in-service evaluation. However, there are a number of factors that must be worked through before a final decision can be reached. And of course, I'm always happy, uh, as, will, as is the Health Secretary, to meet with Bob Doris on this very important issue. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Douglas Ross. And there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so.